The Citizen's Almanac, Section 1, Message from the Director. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bo Wood. The Citizen's Almanac, Fundamental Documents, Symbols, and Anthems, of the United States by U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Section 1. Today, you are a citizen of the United States of America, becoming a peer of kings, as President Calvin Coolidge once said. This occasion is a defining moment that should not soon be forgotten, for it marks the beginning of a new era in your lifetime as a U.S. citizen. Naturalized citizens are an important part of our great democracy, bringing a wealth of talent, ability, and character to this nation. Your fellow citizens recognize the sacrifices you have made to reach this milestone, and with open arms, we welcome you. The United States offers an abundance of freedom and opportunity for all its citizens, and we wish you all the best along the way. As you will read in this booklet, The Citizen's Almanac, naturalized citizens have played an important role in shaping this country, from Alexander Hamilton to Albert Einstein, foreign born Americans have contributed to all aspects of society, literature, motion pictures, public service, and athletics, to name just a few. As a citizen of the United States, it is now your turn to add to this great legacy. For more than 200 years, we have been bound by the principles and ideals expressed in our founding documents. But it is up to citizens like you to carry on this legacy for future generations. Upon taking the oath of allegiance, you claimed for yourself the God-given, unalienable rights that the Declaration of Independence sets forth as a natural right to all people. You also made a commitment to this country and were therefore awarded its highest privilege U.S. citizenship, but great responsibilities accompany this privilege. You now have certain rights and responsibilities that you must exercise in order to maintain our system of government. By becoming an active and participatory citizen, you further strengthen the foundation of our nation. The United States of America is now your country and the Citizens' Almanac contains information on the history, people, and events that have brought us where we are today as a beacon of hope and freedom to the world. We hope the contents of this booklet will serve as a constant reminder of the important rights and responsibilities you now have as a U.S. citizen. By continuing to learn about your new country, its founding ideals, achievements, and history, you will enjoy the fruits of responsible citizenship for years to come. Through your efforts, the freedom and liberty of future generations will be preserved and ensured. May you find fulfillment and success in all your endeavors as a citizen of this great nation. Congratulations and welcome. May the United States of America provide you peace, opportunity, and security. End of section one. Recording by Bo Wood. The Citizens' Almanac, section two. Rights and Responsibilities of U.S. Citizens. This is a LibriVox recording. 
all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the citizens almanac fundamental documents symbols and anthems of the united states by u s department of homeland security section two citizenship in america rights and responsibilities of u s citizens all people in the united states have the basic freedoms and protections outlined in our founding documents the declaration of independence and the constitution for more than two hundred years we have been bound by the ideals expressed in these documents because of these ideals our society has prospered the u s government as established in the constitution protects the rights of each individual without regard to background culture or religion we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life liberty and the pursuit of happiness declaration of independence to keep our system of representative democracy and individual freedom you should strive to become an active participant in american civic life when you took the oath of allegiance you promised your loyalty and allegiance to the united states of america you now have other rights and responsibilities only given to united states citizens these include the right to vote in federal elections and the ability to serve on a jury citizenship is a privilege that offers you the extraordinary opportunity to be a part of the governing process the strength of the united states is in the will of its citizens former supreme court justice louis brandeis once said the only title in our democracy superior to that of president is the title of citizen in the united states the power of government comes directly from people like you to protect freedom and liberty u s citizens must participate in the democratic process and in their communities the following is a list of some of the most important rights and responsibilities that all citizens should exercise and respect we encourage you to read the constitution to learn more about all of the rights and responsibilities of united states citizenship rights of a citizen freedom to express yourself freedom of expression includes several individual rights it includes freedom of speech freedom to peaceably assemble and the freedom to petition the government for a redress of grievances in a representative democracy individual beliefs and opinions are important to our national dialogue and necessary to maintain a responsible citizenry americans can speak and act as they wish as long as it does not endanger others or obstruct another's freedom of expression in the process freedom to worship as you wish in the united states the freedom to hold any religious belief or none at all is considered a basic or unalienable right the government cannot violate this right religious intolerance is unacceptable in a society where everyone has individual freedom in cases where religious practices hurt the common good or endanger the health of others the supreme court has imposed minor limitations on the way some religious practices are performed right to a prompt fair trial by jury people accused of a crime have the right to a speedy and fair trial by a jury of peers in a free society those accused of a crime are assumed innocent until proven guilty in a court of law the american system of justice treats all people fairly ensuring the rights of the individual are maintained right to keep and bear arms the constitution protects the rights of individuals to have firearms for personal defense this privilege is subject to reasonable restrictions designed to prevent unfit persons or those with the intent to criminally misuse guns or other firearms from obtaining such items right to vote in elections for public officials by voting in federal state and local elections citizens choose their government leaders the right to vote is one of the most important liberties granted to american citizens it is the foundation of a free society 
right to apply for federal employment public service is a worthy endeavor and can lead to an extremely rewarding career working for the american people many federal government jobs require applicants to have u s citizenship as a u s citizen you can apply for federal employment within a government agency or department right to run for elected office u s citizenship is required for many elected offices in this country naturalized u s citizens can run for any elected office they choose with the exception of president and vice president of the united states which require candidates to be native-born citizens freedom to pursue life liberty and the pursuit of happiness as a society based on individual freedom it is the inherent right of all americans to pursue life liberty and the pursuit of happiness the united states is a land of opportunity people are able to choose their own path in life based on personal goals and objectives americans can make their own decisions and pursue their own interests as long as it does not interfere with the rights of others responsibilities of a citizen support and defend the constitution against all enemies foreign and domestic the constitution establishes the u s system of representative democracy and outlines the inherent principles of freedom liberty and opportunity to which all citizens are entitled the continuity of this nation's unique freedoms depends on the support of its citizens when the constitution and its ideals are challenged citizens must defend these principles against all adversaries stay informed of the issues affecting your community before casting your vote in an election be sure to gain information about the issues and candidates running for office staying informed allows citizens the opportunity to keep the candidates and laws responsive to the needs of the local community participate in the democratic process voting in federal state and local elections is the most important responsibility of any citizen voting ensures that our system of government is maintained and individual voices are clearly heard by elected officials respect and obey federal state and local laws laws are rules of conduct that are established by an authority and followed by the community to maintain order in a free society every person living in the united states must follow laws established through federal state and local authorities respect the rights beliefs and opinions of others though the united states is a nation of diverse backgrounds and cultures our common civic values unite us as one nation tolerance through courtesy and respect for the beliefs and opinions of others is the hallmark of a civilized society and ensures the continuity of liberty and freedom for future generations participate in your local community being a responsible member of one's local community is important to the success of representative democracy community engagement through volunteerism participation in town hall meetings and public hearings joining a local parent teacher association and running for public office are ways individuals can actively contribute to the well-being of the community pay income and other taxes honestly and on time to federal state and local authorities taxes pay for government services for the people of the united states some of these services include educating children and adults keeping our country safe and secure and providing medical services to the elderly and less fortunate paying taxes on time and in full ensures that these services continue for all americans serve on a jury when called upon serving on a jury is a very important service to your community in the united states the constitution guarantees that all persons accused of a crime have the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury jury service gives you the opportunity to participate in the vital task of achieving just fair results in matters that come before the court defend the country if the need should arise the armed forces of the united states the military is currently an all-volunteer force however should the need arise in time of war it is important that all citizens join together and assist the nation 
where they are able this support could include defending the nation through military non-combatant or civilian service end of section two the citizens almanac section three patriotic anthems star-spangled banner this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by betty b the citizens almanac fundamental documents symbols and anthems of the united states by u s department of homeland security section three patriotic anthems and symbols of the united states beginning early in our nation's history citizens have used songs poems and symbols to express the ideals and values of the united states from solemn oaths such as the pledge of allegiance and the oath of allegiance which one must take to become a citizen to the more informal tradition of singing the star-spangled banner before sporting events spoken expressions have always been an important part of american civic life as you will learn in this section these songs and poems often came from a writer's personal interpretation of america's ideals as with the story of emma lazarus and the new colossus the values and history of the united states are also expressed through visual symbols such as the great seal of the united states and the flag of the united states of america around the world these two emblems are used to symbolize our solidarity as a nation as a u s citizen you can take pride in these symbols and the fact that they represent you and your country the following section will introduce you to the history and meaning behind some of our most important patriotic anthems and symbols the star-spangled banner eighteen fourteen by francis scott key the star-spangled banner is the national anthem of the united states it was written by francis scott key after a critical battle in the war of eighteen twelve key a lawyer and amateur poet had been sent to baltimore maryland to secure the release of dr william beans an american taken prisoner by the british boarding a british ship for the negotiations key was treated with respect by the british officers who agreed to release dr beans although the mission was completed the british were about to attack fort mchenry the american fort guarding baltimore and so they did not allow the americans to return to shore for twenty-five hours british gunboats shelled fort mchenry the americans withstood the attack and on the morning of september fourteenth eighteen fourteen key peered through clearing smoke to see an enormous american flag waving proudly above the fort key was so inspired by the sight of the american flag that he began a poem to commemorate the occasion he wrote the poem to be sung to the popular british song to anacreon in heaven the significance and popularity of the song spread across the united states in nineteen sixteen president woodrow wilson ordered that the song be played at military and naval occasions in nineteen thirty one the star-spangled banner became the official national anthem of the united states the star-spangled banner o oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there o oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave end of section three citizens almanac section four america the beautiful and god bless america this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. The Citizens' Almanac. Fundamental Documents, Symbols, and Anthems of the United States by U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Section 4. 
America the Beautiful by Catherine Lee Bates, 1893. America the Beautiful was written in 1893 by Catherine Lee Bates, a professor of English literature at Wellesley College in Massachusetts. Bates wrote the lyrics while on a trip to Colorado Springs, Colorado. Describing the extraordinary view at the top of Pike's Peak, she said, It was then and there, as I was looking out over the sea-like expanse of fertile country, spreading away so far under those ample skies that the opening lines of the hymn floated into my mind. On July 4, 1895, America the Beautiful first appeared in print in The Congregationalist, a weekly journal. A few months later, the lyrics were set to music by Silas G. Pratt. Bates revised the lyrics in 1904 after receiving many requests to use the song in publications and special services. In 1913, Bates made an additional change to the wording of the third verse, creating the version we know today. For several years, America the Beautiful was sung to just about any popular or folk tune that would fit with the lyrics. In 1926, the National Federation of Music Clubs held a contest to put the poem to music, but failed to select a winner. Today, America the Beautiful is sung to Samuel A. Ward's 1882 melody, Materna. America the Beautiful O oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee, and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. O oh, beautiful for pilgrim feet, whose stern impassioned stress, a thoroughfare for freedom beat across the wilderness. America, America, God mend thine every flaw. Confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. O oh, beautiful for heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country loved, and mercy more than life. America, America, may God thy gold refine, till all success be nobleness and every gain divine. O oh, beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years thine alabaster cities gleam undimmed by human tears. America, America, God shed his grace on thee, and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. End of America the Beautiful God Bless America by Irving Berlin, 1938 Irving Berlin, a Russian immigrant who became a naturalized U.S. citizen in 1918, wrote the song, God Bless America, while serving in the U.S. Army. Originally composed for a musical review, Berlin made a few slight alterations to the lyrics and introduced the song in 1938. Singer Kate Smith sang the song for the first time to a national audience during her radio broadcast on November 11, 1938, in honor of Armistice Day, now Veterans Day. The song became popular almost immediately, and soon after its introduction, Berlin established the God Bless America Fund, with which he dedicated the royalties from the song to the Boy and Girl Scouts of America. God Bless America is recognized today as America's unofficial national anthem. God Bless America 
while the storm clouds gather far across the sea let us swear allegiance to a land that's free let us all be grateful for a land so fair as we raise our voices in a solemn prayer god bless america land that i love stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above from the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam god bless america my home sweet home end of section four the citizen's almanac section five i hear america singing and concord hymn this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schampf. The Citizen's Almanac. Fundamental Documents, Symbols, and Anthems of the United States. By U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Section 5. I Hear America Singing. From Leaves of Grass, 1860 edition. By Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman, who lived from 1819 to 1892, is one of the most influential and beloved of American poets. As a young man, Whitman worked as a teacher in one-room schools on Long Island, New York. He taught until 1841, when he decided to begin a full-time career in journalism. Whitman established The Long Islander, a weekly newspaper in New York and often edited other newspapers in the surrounding area. He also spent time in New Orleans, Louisiana, and Washington, D.C. By traveling to different cities in the United States, Whitman was exposed to how Americans lived in a variety of places. These experiences provided inspiration for some of Whitman's famous poems about his fellow countrymen, including I Hear America Singing, this poem was included in Whitman's most cherished work, the poetry collection Leaves of Grass. Throughout his life, Whitman produced several editions of Leaves of Grass, a varied collection that began with only 12 poems in the 1855 first edition, and contained nearly 400 poems by the time the final edition was published in 1891. I Hear America Singing, a celebration of the American people, was added to the collection in 1860. I hear America singing. I hear America singing, the varied carols I hear. Those of mechanics, each one singing his, as it should be blithe and strong. The carpenter, singing his, as he measures his plank or beam. The mason, singing his, as he makes ready for work, or leaves off work. The boatman, singing what belongs to him in his boat, the deckhand singing on the steamboat deck, the shoemaker singing as he sits on his bench, the hatter singing as he stands, the woodcutter's song, the plowboy's on his way in the morning, or at noon intermission, or at sundown, the delicious singing of the mother, or of the young wife at work, or of the girl sewing or washing, each singing what belongs to him or her and to none else, the day what belongs to the day, at night, the party of young fellows, robust, friendly, singing with open mouths their strong, melodious songs. Concord Hymn, 1837, by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Ralph Waldo Emerson was a celebrated American author, poet, philosopher, and public speaker. He became the leader of a famous intellectual movement known as Transcendentalism. Emerson had strong ties to the beginning of America's fight for independence. His grandfather was present at the opening battle of the American Revolution, the Battle of Lexington and Concord, in Massachusetts on April 19, 1775. His family home was also located next to the battlefield site. Concord Hymn was written originally as a song for the dedication of the obelisk, a monument commemorating the valiant effort of those who fought in the battle of lexington and concord the gunshot which began this battle is considered the beginning of america's fight for independence 
and is referred to by emerson as the shot heard round the world this phrase has since become famous and is often used in discussions of the american revolution conquered him by the rude bridge that arched the flood their flag to april's breeze unfurled here once the embattled farmers stood and fired the shot heard round the world the foe long since in silence slept alike the conqueror silent sleeps and time the ruined bridge has swept down the dark stream which seaward creeps on this green bank by this soft stream we set to-day a votive stone that memory may their deed redeem when like our sires our sons are gone spirit that made those heroes dare to die and leave their children free bid time and nature gently spare the shaft we raise to them and thee End of section five. Citizens' Almanac, section six. The New Colossus, 1883, and Flag of the United States of America. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. The Citizens' Almanac fundamental documents symbols and anthems of the united states by u s department of homeland security section six the new colossus eighteen eighty three by emma lazarus as part of an auction held in eighteen eighty three to raise funds for a pedestal to be placed beneath the statue of liberty which was a gift to america from france as part of the centennial celebration of eighteen seventy six emma lazarus wrote the new colossus her poem spoke to the millions of immigrants who came to america in search of freedom and opportunity she saw the new statue as a symbol of hope and inspiration to the world in nineteen o two the poem was engraved on a bronze plaque at the base of the statue of liberty the new colossus not like the brazen giant of greek fame with conquering limbs astride from land to land here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name mother of exiles from her beacon hand glows world-wide welcome her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame keep ancient lands your storied pomp cries she with silent lips give me your tired your poor your huddled masses yearning to breathe free the wretched refuse of your teeming shore send these the homeless tempest tossed to me i lift my lamp beside the golden door End of the New Colossus Flag of the United States of America As America fought for its independence from Great Britain, it soon became evident that the new nation needed a flag of its own to identify American forts and ships. A design of thirteen alternating red and white stripes and thirteen stars in a blue field was accepted by the continental congress on june fourteenth seventeen seventy seven these stars and stripes honored the thirteen states that had joined together to form the united states of america as the united states expanded however more states were added to the union to celebrate the nation's growth congress decided that the flag should become a visible symbol of change and established that the american flag would have one star for every state the design of the american flag has changed twenty-seven times and since nineteen fifty nine it has had fifty stars and thirteen stripes the american flag is called the star-spangled banner the stars and stripes the red white and blue and old glory to emphasize the importance of the american flag to the nation and its people 
Congress established June 14 of each year as Flag Day. On this day, Americans take special notice of the flag and reflect on its meaning. End of Section 6 The Citizen's Almanac Section 7 Pledge of Allegiance Great Seal of the United States and Motto of the United States this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Datcher. The Citizen's Almanac, Fundamental Documents, Symbols, and Anthems of the United States by U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Section 7. Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance was first published on September 8, 1892, in the Youth's Companion magazine. The original pledge read as follows. I pledge allegiance to my flag and the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Children in public schools across the country recited the pledge for the first time on October 12, 1892, as part of official Columbus Day observances to celebrate the 400th anniversary of his discovery of America. In 1942, by an official act, Congress recognized the pledge. The phrase, under God, was added to the pledge by another act of Congress on June 14, 1954. Upon signing the legislation to authorize the addition, President Dwight D. Eisenhower said, In this way we are reaffirming the transcendence of religious faith in America's heritage and future. In this way we shall constantly strengthen those spiritual weapons which forever will be our country's most powerful resource in peace and war. When delivering the Pledge of Allegiance, all must be standing at attention, facing the flag, with the right hand over the heart. Men not in uniform should remove any non-religious headdress with their right hand and hold it at the left shoulder, the hand being over the heart. Those in uniform should remain silent, face the flag, and render the military salute. Pledge of Allegiance I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great Seal of the United States On July 4, 1776, the Continental Congress appointed a committee to create a seal for the United States of America. Following the appointment of two additional committees, each building upon the other, the Great Seal was finalized and approved on June 20, 1782. The Great Seal has two sides, an obverse or front side and a reverse side. The obverse side displays a bald eagle, the national bird in the center. The bald eagle holds a scroll inscribed E Pluribus Unum in its beak. The phrase means, out of many, one, in Latin, and signifies one nation that was created from thirteen separate colonies. In one of the eagle's claws is an olive branch, and in the other is a bundle of thirteen arrows. The olive branch signifies peace, and the arrows signify war. A shield with thirteen red and white stripes covers the eagle's breast. The eagle alone supports the shield to signify that America should rely on their own virtue and not that of other nations. The red and white stripes of the shield represent the states united under and supporting the blue, representing the president and Congress. The color red signifies valor and bravery. The color white signifies purity and innocence. And the color blue signifies vigilance, perseverance, and justice. Above the eagle's head is a cloud that surrounds a blue field containing 13 stars which form a constellation. The constellation represents the fact that the new nation is taking its place among the sovereign powers. 
the reverse side contains a thirteen-step pyramid with the year seventeen seventy six in roman numerals at its base above the pyramid is the eye of providence and the motto annuit septis meaning he god favors our undertaking below the pyramid novus ordo seclorum meaning new order of the ages is written on a scroll to signify the beginning of the new american era the obverse side of the great seal is used on postage stamps military uniforms u s passports and above the doors of u s embassies worldwide both sides are present on the one dollar bill motto of the united states on july thirty nineteen fifty six president dwight d eisenhower approved a joint resolution of the eighty fourth congress officially establishing the phrase in god we trust as the national motto of the united states in god we trust replaced the phrase e pluribus unum which had been selected as the nation's official motto in 1776. The motto, In God We Trust, can be traced back nearly 200 years in U.S. history. During the War of 1812, as the morning light revealed that the American flag was still waving above Fort McHenry, Francis Scott Key wrote the poem that would eventually become our national anthem. The final stanza of the poem read, And this be our motto, in god is our trust in 1864 key's phrase was changed to in god we trust and included on the redesigned two-cent coin the following year congress authorized the director of the philadelphia mint to place the motto on all gold and silver coins the motto began appearing on all u s coins in 1938 in god we trust became part of the design of u s currency paper money in 1957 the bureau of engraving and printing has incorporated the motto in all currency since 1963 in god we trust is also engraved on the wall above the speaker's dais in the chamber of the house of representatives and over the entrance to the chamber of the senate end of section seven the citizens almanac section eight presidential and historical speeches george washington this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by matthew datcher the citizens almanac fundamental documents symbols and anthems of the united states by u s department of homeland security Section 8. Presidential and Historical Speeches People in the United States greatly value their current in historical leaders. Following our democratic tradition, these leaders are remembered not only for their actions, but also for their speeches and proclamations to the American people. Beginning with President George Washington's call for unity in his 1796 farewell address, American leaders often emphasize similar themes when addressing the nation. President Abraham Lincoln perhaps best expressed the concept of unity and a common civic identity during the American Civil War when our nation's unity was severely threatened. Lincoln's speeches are also famous for referring to America, with its values and democratic system, as an important example for the rest of the world. Much later, Presidents Franklin D. Roosevelt and John F. Kennedy called upon these same ideas in important speeches during times of crisis, and President Ronald Reagan was clearly inspired by these principles in his call for freedom around the world during the Cold War. In this section, you will also read about a leader who, rather than looking outside our borders, called on America itself to live up to his promise as a land of liberty and equality. Farewell Address, George Washington, 1796 After leading the Continental Army to victory over the British during the American Revolution, George Washington was the obvious choice to become the first President of the United States. 
known as the father of our country washington performed honorably during his two terms as president in helping form the new government and guiding the young country through several foreign and domestic crises early in the year seventeen ninety six washington decided not to see re-election for a third time and began drafting a farewell address to the american people with the help of treasury secretary alexander hamilton washington completed his farewell address and the final version was printed in philadelphia's american daily advertiser on september nineteenth seventeen ninety six washington was concerned that increasing geographical sectionalism and the rise of political factions would threaten the stability of the eight-year-old constitution and he used his address to urge americans to unite for the long-term success of the nation he called for a distinctly american character that concentrated on the good of the country and would avoid potentially troublesome alliances with foreign nations on february twenty two eighteen sixty two when america was engulfed in the civil war both houses of the u s congress agreed to assemble and read aloud washington's farewell address this practice was later revived and performed annually by both houses of congress since eighteen ninety three the u s senate has observed our first president's birthday by selecting one of its members to read aloud washington's farewell address from the senate floor excerpts citizens by birth or choice of a common country that country has a right to concentrate your affections the name of american which belongs to you in your national capacity must always exalt the just pride of patriotism more than any appellation derived from the local discriminations with slight shades of difference you have the same religion manners habits and political principles you have a common cause fought and triumphed together the independence and liberty you possess are the work of joint councils and joint efforts of common dangers sufferings and successes it is substantially true that virtue or morality is a necessary spring of popular government the rule indeed extends with more or less force to every species of free government who that is a sincere friend to it can look with indifference upon attempts to shake the foundation of the fabric promote then as an object of primary importance institutions for the general diffusion of knowledge in proportion as the structure of a government gives force to public opinion it is essential that the public opinion should be enlightened end of section eight The Citizens' Almanac, Section 9 First Inaugural Address and Gettysburg Address by Abraham Lincoln This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Citizens' Almanac, Fundamental Documents, Symbols, and Anthems of the United States by u s department of homeland security section nine first inaugural address eighteen sixty one abraham lincoln abraham lincoln was sworn in as the sixteenth president of the united states on march fourth eighteen sixty one this was a difficult time in our nation's history the issues of how much control the federal government should have over the states and whether to permit slavery in the newly acquired western territories divided the union in december eighteen sixty shortly after lincoln's election was declared final the state of south carolina seceded from the union by february eighteen sixty one six additional states seceded and formed the confederate states of america under provisional president jefferson davis in an effort to calm the fears of the southern states lincoln turned to four historic documents when preparing his inaugural remarks each of these references were concerned with states rights daniel webster's eighteen thirty reply to robert y hayne president andrew jackson's nullification proclamation of eighteen thirty two henry clay's compromise speech of eighteen fifty and the constitution of the united states lincoln believed that secession was illegal 
and as chief executive it was his responsibility to preserve the union the resulting speech was a message of unity to a troubled nation excerpts by the frame of the government under which we live this same people have wisely given their public servants but little power for mischief and have with equal wisdom provided for the return of that little to their own hands at very short intervals while the people retain their virtue and vigilance no administration by any extreme of wickedness or folly can very seriously injure the government in the short space of four years i am loath to close we are not enemies but friends we must not be enemies though passion may have strained it must not break our bonds of affection the mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the union when again touched as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature gettysburg address eighteen sixty three abraham lincoln considered one of the most important speeches in american history abraham lincoln's gettysburg address successfully expressed the principles of liberty and equality that the united states was founded upon and proudly honored those that fought and perished for the survival of the union during his remarks he spoke of a new birth of freedom for the nation lincoln delivered this speech at the dedication of the soldiers national cemetery at gettysburg on november nineteenth eighteen sixty three the entire speech lasted just two minutes the battle of gettysburg took place july first through the third eighteen sixty three in the rural town of gettysburg pennsylvania roughly fifty miles northwest of baltimore maryland confederate forces led by general robert e lee's army of northern virginia invaded union territory seeking to take the war out of virginia and put the union army in a vulnerable defensive position general lee's soldiers fought the union's army of the potomac under the command of general george c meade when the fighting ended on july third the two sides suffered more than forty five thousand casualties making it one of the bloodiest battles to date confederate forces retreated back to virginia on the night of july fourth eighteen sixty three and the battle of gettysburg is considered by most scholars to be the turning point in the american civil war gettysburg address fourscore and seven years ago our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal now we are engaged in a great civil war testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure we are met on a great battlefield of that war we have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that the nation might live it is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this but in a larger sense we cannot dedicate we cannot consecrate we cannot hallow this ground the brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract the world will little note nor long remember what we say here but it can never forget what they did here it is for us the living rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced it is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain that this nation under god shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people by the people for the people shall not perish from the earth end of section nine the citizens almanac section ten the four freedoms franklin d roosevelt and inaugural address john f kennedy this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by betty b the citizens almanac fundamental documents symbols and anthems of the united states by u s department of homeland security section ten the four freedoms nineteen forty one franklin d roosevelt in january nineteen forty one as much of europe had fallen victim to the advancing army of nazi germany franklin d roosevelt began his unprecedented third term as president of the united states great britain was finding it increasingly difficult to hold off the aggressive german army and roosevelt considered the germans to be a significant threat to u s national security during his annual state of the union address on january sixth nineteen forty one roosevelt pledged his support for great britain by continuing aid and increasing production at war industries in the united states by aiding in the war effort roosevelt explained that the united states would be protecting the universal freedoms and liberties to which all people are entitled not just americans in his speech roosevelt staunchly defended democracy around the world and stated that the united states would not be intimidated by the threats of dictators he concluded by eloquently describing four essential human freedoms that the united states hoped to secure and extend to all individuals these universal freedoms were freedom of speech and expression freedom of every person to worship god in his own way freedom from want and freedom from fear in nineteen forty three following america's entry into world war two artist norman rockwell captured the idea of these four basic freedoms in a series of paintings published in the popular magazine the saturday evening post the painting served as the centerpiece of an exhibition that toured the united states to help raise money for the war effort excerpts i address you the members of the seventy seventh congress at a moment unprecedented in the history of the union i use the word unprecedented because at no previous time has american security been as seriously threatened from without as it is to-day as a nation we may take pride in the fact that we are soft-hearted but we cannot afford to be soft-headed just as our national policy in internal affairs has been based upon a decent respect for the rights and the dignity of all our fellow men within our gates so our national policy in foreign affairs has been based on a decent respect for the rights and dignity of all nations large and small and the justice of morality must and will win in the end in the future days which we seek to make secure we look forward to a world founded upon four essential human freedoms the first is freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world the second is freedom of every person to worship god in his own way everywhere in the world the third is freedom from want which translated into world terms means economic understandings which will secure to every nation a healthy peacetime life for its inhabitants everywhere in the world the fourth is freedom from fear which translated into world terms means a worldwide reduction of armaments to such a point and in such a thorough fashion that no nation will be in a position to commit an act of physical aggression against any neighbor anywhere in the world that is no vision of a distant millennium it is a definite basis for a kind of world attainable in our own time and generation that kind of world is the very antithesis of the so-called new order of tyranny which the dictators seek to create with the crash of a bomb to that new order we oppose the greater conception the moral order a good society is able to face schemes of world domination and foreign revolutions alike without fear since the beginning of our american history we have been engaged in change in a perpetual peaceful revolution a revolution which goes on steadily quietly adjusting itself to changing conditions without the concentration camp or the quick lime in the ditch the world order which we seek is the cooperation of free countries working together in a friendly civilized society this nation has placed its destiny 
in the hands and heads and hearts of its millions of free men and women and its faith in freedom under the guidance of god freedom means the supremacy of human rights everywhere our support goes to those who struggle to gain those rights or keep them our strength is our unity of purpose to that high concept there can be no end save victory inaugural address john f kennedy nineteen sixty one in nineteen sixty john f kennedy defeated richard m nixon to become the thirty-fifth president of the united states a world war ii hero and former representative and senator from massachusetts kennedy and his young family brought an optimistic youthful spirit to the white house at the time america's cold war struggle with the communist-led union of soviet socialist republics was becoming increasingly volatile around the world from germany to cuba to southeast asia tension between u s supported forces and soviet supported forces threatened to unleash a devastating nuclear exchange on january twentieth nineteen sixty one kennedy delivered his inaugural address on the steps of the u s capitol in washington d c his remarks focused on the critical foreign policy issues of the time in stating that the united states would pay any price bear any burden he was signaling american resolve to support the forces of freedom in the face of the communist challenge kennedy however also presented an alternate vision calling on the soviets and americans to pursue arms control negotiations and the struggle against the common enemies of man tyranny poverty disease and war itself as a young president kennedy saw himself as part of a new generation of americans and he was not afraid to ask his generation to work toward a better world in the most famous part of the speech kennedy challenged americans to move beyond self-interest and work for their country saying ask not what your country can do for you ask what you can do for your country excerpts we observe today not a victory of party but a celebration of freedom symbolizing an end as well as a beginning signifying renewal as well as change for i have sworn before you and almighty god the same solemn oath our forebears prescribed nearly a century and three quarters ago the world is very different now for man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life and yet the same revolutionary beliefs for which our forebears fought are still at issue around the globe the belief that the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state but from the hand of god we dare not forget to-day that we are the heirs of that first revolution let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of americans born in this century tempered by war disciplined by a hard and bitter peace proud of our ancient heritage and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed to-day at home and around the world let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill that we shall pay any price bear any burden meet any hardship support any friend oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty in the long history of the world only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger i do not shrink from this responsibility i welcome it i do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation the energy the faith the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it and the glow from that fire can truly light the world and so my fellow americans ask not what your country can do for you ask what you can do for your country my fellow citizens of the world ask not what america will do for you but what together we can do for the freedom of man finally whether you are citizens of america or citizens of the world ask of us here the same high standards of strength and sacrifice 
which we ask of you with a good conscience our only sure reward with history the final judge of our deeds let us go forth to lead the land we love asking his blessing and his help but knowing that here on earth god's work must truly be our own end of section ten citizens almanac section eleven i have a dream by martin luther king jr and remarks at the brandenburg gate by ronald reagan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by melvin lee the citizens almanac fundamental documents symbols and anthems of the united states by u s department of homeland security section eleven i have a dream nineteen sixty three by martin luther king jr on august twenty eighth nineteen sixty three nearly two hundred and fifty thousand people gathered in washington d c as part of the march on washington for jobs and freedom the demonstrators marched from the washington monument to the lincoln memorial where individuals from all segments of society called for civil rights and equal protection for all citizens regardless of color or background the last speaker of the day was dr martin luther king jr whose i have a dream speech encompassed the ideals set forth in the declaration of independence that all men are created equal king's message of freedom and democracy for all people of all races and backgrounds is remembered as the landmark statement of the civil rights movement in the united states the following year congress passed the civil rights act of nineteen sixty four which prohibited segregation in public places provided for the integration of public schools and facilities and made employment on the basis of race and ethnicity illegal this act was the most comprehensive civil rights legislation since the reconstruction era following the american civil war excerpts i say to you today my friends so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow i still have a dream it is a dream deeply rooted in the american dream i have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal i have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character this will be the day this will be the day when all of god's children will be able to sing with new meaning my country tis of thee sweet land of liberty of thee i sing land where my fathers died land of the pilgrim's pride from every mountain side let freedom ring and when this happens when we allow freedom to ring when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet from every state and every city we will be able to speed up that day when all of god's children black men and white men jews and gentiles protestants and catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old negro spiritual free at last free at last thank god almighty we are free at last and of i have a dream by martin luther king jr remarks at the nineteen eighty seven brandenburg gate by ronald reagan on june twelfth nineteen eighty seven president ronald reagan delivered a formal address to the people of west berlin in front of the brandenburg gate a once proud symbol of german unity at the time a wall surrounding west berlin separated the city from east berlin and other areas of east germany the barrier known as the berlin wall was heavily guarded and east germany's communist government did not allow its people access to west berlin the berlin wall was a symbol of the tyranny that restrained freedom and individual liberty throughout the communist bloc of eastern europe because of the gate's proximity to east berlin reagan's speech could be heard on the eastern side of the wall as well in his remarks he spoke of the increasing divide between the freedom and the prosperity of the west and the political slavery of communist eastern europe dominated at the time by 
the union of soviet socialist republics reagan imagined a world in which east and west were united in freedom rather than oppression he believed that ultimately totalitarianism and oppression could not suppress the freedoms that are entitled to all individuals reagan's direct challenge to soviet leader mikhail gorbachev saying if you seek peace if you seek prosperity for the soviet union and eastern europe if you seek liberalization mr gorbachev tear down this wall is considered by many to have affirmed the dissolution of the soviet union and the end of communist stronghold over eastern europe excerpts behind me stands a wall that encircles the free sectors of this city part of a vast system of barriers that divides the entire continent of europe from the baltic south those barriers cut across germany in a gash of barbed wire concrete dog runs and guard towers farther south there may be no visible no obvious wall but there remain armed guards and checkpoints all the same still a restriction on the right to travel still an instrument to impose upon ordinary men and women the will of a totalitarian state yet it is here in berlin where the wall emerges most clearly here cutting across your city where the news photo and the television screen have imprinted this brutal division of a continent upon the mind of the world standing before the brandenburg gate every man is a german separated from his fellow men every man is a berliner forced to look upon a scar general secretary gorbachev if you seek peace if you seek prosperity for the soviet union and eastern europe if you seek liberalization come here to this gate mr gorbachev open this gate mr gorbachev tear down this wall end of section eleven Citizens' Almanac, Section 12, Fundamental Documents of American Democracy, and Mayflower Compact, 1620. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. The Citizens' Almanac, Fundamental Documents, Symbols, and Anthems of the United States by U.S. Department of Homeland Security section twelve fundamental documents of american democracy in its most basic form the u s system of government is a mutual agreement between the people and the government to ensure that the individual liberties are maintained and continue to prosper under a free society this idea was established upon the signing of the mayflower compact by some of america's first settlers the pilgrims in sixteen twenty the declaration of independence signed on july four seventeen seventy six listed america's reasons for independence from great britain but also further explained the rights of free people and how they should live under a responsible government as it developed into a nation based upon the firm foundation of the constitution the united states government has continued to adapt in order to live up to its promise of liberty and equality for all individuals. The Federalist Papers, written between 1787 and 1788, give today's citizens a remarkable look into the framing of our government more than 200 years ago. Through the Bill of Rights and 17 subsequent amendments, the Constitution has been changed over the years to solidify america's promise of liberty for all its citizens the following section introduces you to these and other important documents that have helped make the united states the land of opportunity it is today the mayflower compact sixteen twenty in the late fifteen hundreds several religious groups in england wanted to establish a new church completely independent from the church of england these individuals were called separatists and were often persecuted because of their religious practices and beliefs one of these groups became known as the pilgrims after continuously being denied the right to establish their own church in england the pilgrims decided to move their families to holland 
while holland allowed them to worship freely the pilgrims soon began to miss the language and customs of life in england after much discussion the pilgrims decided to move the entire community to america where they could practice their religious beliefs and still maintain an english lifestyle on september sixth sixteen twenty their ship called the mayflower set sail for america two months later the pilgrims landed off the coast of massachusetts much further north than they originally intended since this land was outside the jurisdiction of the virginia colony's government in jamestown the group agreed to draft a social contract for self-government based on consent of the governed and majority rule all male adults signed the contract and agreed to be bound by its rules this agreement became known as the mayflower compact and was the first act of european self-government in america the concept that government is a form of covenant between two parties the government and the people was a major source of inspiration to the framers of the u s constitution the mayflower compact we whose names are underwritten the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign lord king james by the grace of god of great britain france and ireland king defender of the faith etc having undertaken for the glory of god and advancement of the christian faith and honor of our king and country a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of virginia do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of god and one another covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid and by virtue hereof to enact constitute and frame such just and equal laws ordinances acts constitutions and offices from time to time as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony unto which we promise all due submission and obedience in witness whereof we have hereunder subscribed our names at cape cod the eleventh of november in the year of the reign of our sovereign lord king james of england france and ireland the eighteenth and of scotland the fifty-fourth anno domini sixteen twenty and of section twelve the citizens almanac section thirteen the declaration of independence this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Declaration of Independence Following the end of the French and Indian War in 1763, Great Britain established itself as the dominant power in North America. The victory greatly increased the British presence in North America, but left the British government with a significant amount of debt. Frustrated by what was perceived as a lack of cooperation during the French and Indian War, Great Britain demanded that, at the very least, the colonists should pay for the cost of their own government and security. The British began tightening control over the colonies by bypassing colonial legislatures and imposing direct taxes and laws that angered many American colonists. In 1764, the Sugar Act was enacted by the British Parliament and became the first law with the specific goal of raising money from the colonies. This law was followed by the Currency Act, which prohibited the colonies from issuing their own currency, the Quartering Act, which required the colonies to provide housing and supplies to British troops, and the Stamp Act, which directly taxed the colonies by requiring all documents and packages to obtain a stamp, showing that the tax had been paid. Violations of these acts often led to harsh judgments by British-appointed judges, without the consent of local juries. American colonists responded to these acts with organised protest, arguing against taxation without proper representation in Parliament. 
they believed that the strong measures enacted by the government violated their rights as British citizens. The colonists also believed that government should not interfere in the daily lives of its citizens, but should serve to secure and protect the liberty and property of the people. On September the 5th, 1774, delegates from 12 of the 13 colonies convened in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, for the First Continental Congress. During the meeting, they prepared a petition, called the Declaration of Rights and Grievances, for King George III, King of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. They also established the Association of 1774, which urged the colonists to avoid using British goods. Before adjourning, the delegates planned for a Second Continental Congress to meet on May the 10th, 1775, in case the British failed to respond adequately to its petition. The Second Continental Congress convened in May 1775, and following much debate, agreed that reconciliation with Britain was impossible. On June the 7th, 1776, Virginia delegate Richard Henry Lee called for a resolution of independence. Congress then appointed John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Robert R. Livingston, and Roger Sherman to draft a statement of independence for the colonies, with Jefferson assigned to perform the actual writing of the document. In writing the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson drew heavily upon the idea of natural rights and individual liberty. These ideas had been widely expressed by 17th century philosopher John Locke and others at the time. The beginning of the document explains that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Jefferson then listed formal grievances against Great Britain, thus justifying the colony's decision to completely break away from the mother country. On July the 2nd, 1776, the document was sent to Congress for consideration and debate. Two days later, on July the 4th, 1776, Congress unanimously adopted the Declaration of Independence. Of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, eight were foreign-born. They included Button Gwinnett, England, Francis Lewis, Wales, Robert Morris, England, James Smith, Ireland, George Taylor, Ireland, Matthew Thornton, Ireland, James Wilson, Scotland, and John Witherspoon, Scotland. The Declaration of Independence Action of Second Continental Congress, July the 4th, 1776 The Unanimous Declaration of the Thirteen United States of America When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organising its powers in such a form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and accordingly all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, 
it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let fact be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance, unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained, and when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them, and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records, for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly, for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time, after such dissolutions, to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers, incapable of annihilation, have returned to the people at large for their exercise, the state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without, and convulsions within. He has endeavoured to prevent the population of these states, for that purpose obstructing the laws of naturalisation of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. He has obstructed administration of justice, by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone, for the tenure of their offices, and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices, and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people, and eat out their substance. He has kept among us, in times of peace, standing armies, without the consent of our legislatures. He has affected to render the military independent of, and superior to, the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution, and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretend legislation, for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them, by a mock trial, from punishment from any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us, in many cases, of the benefits of a trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretend offences, for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighbouring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government, and enlarging its boundaries, so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies, for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments, for suspending our own legislatures, and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here, by declaring us out of his protection, and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is, at this time, transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny, already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy, scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages and totally unworthy of the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens, taken captive on the high seas, to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us, and has endeavoured to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers and merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, 
we have petitioned for address in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince, whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant, is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting the attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. We must, therefore, acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation, and hold them, as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general congress, assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do, in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance in the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honour. Signed by order and in behalf of the Congress, John Hancock, President. Attest. Charles Thompson, Secretary. Signers of the Declaration of Independence. Georgia. Button Gwinnett, Lyman Hall, George Walton. North Carolina. William Hooper, Joseph Hughes, John Penn. South Carolina. Edward Rutledge. Thomas Hayward, Jr., Thomas Lynch, Jr., Arthur Middleton. Massachusetts, Samuel Adams, John Adams, Robert Treat Payne, Elbridge Gerry, John Hancock. Maryland, Samuel Chase, William Packer, Thomas Stone, Charles Carroll of Carrollton. Virginia. George Wythe. Richard Henry Lee. Thomas Jefferson. Benjamin Harrison. Thomas Nelson, Jr. Francis Lightfoot Lee. Carter Braxton. Pennsylvania. Robert Morris. Benjamin Rush. Benjamin Franklin, John Morton, George Clymer, James Smith, George Taylor, James Wilson, George Ross, Delaware, Caesar Rodney, George Reed, Thomas McKean, New York, William Floyd, Philip Livingston, Francis Lewis, Lewis Morris. New Jersey, Richard Stockton, John Witherspoon, Francis Hopkinson, John Hart, Abraham Clark. New Hampshire, Josiah Bartlett, Matthew Thornton, William Whipple. Rhode Island. Stephen Hopkins. William Ellery. Connecticut. 
Roger Sherman, Samuel Huntington, William Williams, Oliver Woolcott. End of section 13. Citizen's Almanac, Section 14, The Federalist Papers, 1787-1788, and The Constitution, 1787, of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. The Citizen's Almanac, Fundamental Documents, Symbols and Anthems of the United States by U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Section 14. The Federalist Papers, 1787-1788 by Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison. Following the Constitutional Convention of 1787, a national debate began concerning whether or not to ratify the proposed United States Constitution. Newspapers across the nation published essays and letters on both sides, for and against ratification. The most famous of these writings became known as the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers were a series of 85 essays written by Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison under the pen name Publius. The essays were published primarily in the Independent Journal, and the New York Packet, and their purpose was to urge New York delegates to ratify the proposed United States Constitution. In 1788, the essays were published in a bound volume. The essays explained particular provisions of the United States Constitution in specific detail. Alexander Hamilton and James Madison were both members of the Constitutional Convention, and for this reason, the Federalist Papers offer an exciting look into the intentions of those drafting the United States Constitution. Today, the Federalist Papers are considered to be one of the most important historical documents on the founding principles of the United States form of government. Number 2. John Jay. To all general purposes, we have uniformly been one people, each individual citizen everywhere enjoying the same national rights privileges and protection number twenty two alexander hamilton the fabric of american empire ought to rest on the solid basis of the consent of the people the streams of national power ought to flow from that pure original fountain of all legitimate authority number forty one james madison every man who loves peace every man who loves his country every man who loves liberty ought to have it ever before his eyes that he may cherish in his heart a due attachment to the union of america and be able to set a due value on the means of preserving it number forty six james madison the ultimate authority resides in the people alone number fifty one alexander hamilton or james madison but what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. End of The Federalist Papers by Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison The Constitution, 1787, of the United States in may seventeen eighty seven fifty-five delegates from each of the thirteen states with the exception of rhode island convened in philadelphia pennsylvania to revise the articles of confederation and create a more centralized form of government for the united states two competing plans were presented to the delegates edmund randolph's virginia plan and william patterson's new jersey plan the Virginia plan would create a more powerful central government with three components, an executive, legislative, and judiciary sharing power. The New Jersey plan would revise and amend the current Articles of Confederation to give Congress control over taxes and trade, but still provide each of the states 
with basic autonomy at the local level. Through extensive debate, it soon became clear that amending the Articles of Confederation would not be sufficient and a new form of government would need to be established. The most contentious issues included how much power the central government would have, how the states would be represented in Congress, and how those representatives would be elected. The final document, which was signed on September 17, 1787, combined ideas from both the Virginia and New Jersey plans, creating a central government with three branches and giving states equal representation in the Senate regardless of state size. Representation in the lower chamber, the House of Representatives, was based on state population. The Constitution of the United States is the supreme law of the land and serves as the basic legal framework for the U.S. system of government. It has lasted longer than any other nation's constitution. It has been revised or amended only 27 times since 1787. James Madison, a Virginia delegate and fourth president of the United States, is known as the father of the Constitution. The Preamble to the Constitution We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. End of section 14. Citizens' Almanac, section 15, The Bill of Rights, and Emancipation Proclamation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. The Citizen's Almanac, Fundamental Documents, Symbols, and Anthems of the United States by U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Section 15. The Bill of Rights, 1791. Following the successful creation of a new constitution, which outlined the form and structure of the U.S. government, a public debate concerning the need to protect individual freedoms arose. Many believed that guarantees of individual rights were not needed because, under the Constitution, the people held all power not specifically granted to the central government. Others, with the memory of British tyranny fresh in their minds, demanded a list of individual rights that could be guaranteed to all citizens. As the debate wore on, Thomas Jefferson, then serving as ambassador to France, wrote a letter to James Madison back in America stating, A bill of rights is what the people are entitled to against every government on earth, general or particular, and what no just government should refuse or rest on inference. This position quickly gained popularity and compromise was finally reached. Several states, in their formal ratification of the Constitution, asked for such amendments while others ratified the Constitution with the understanding that the amendments would be offered during the first meeting of Congress. On September 25, 1789, the first Congress of the United States offered 12 amendments to the Constitution that addressed individual freedoms. Two were not ratified immediately but the remaining ten were ratified by three-fourths of the state legislatures on December 15, 1791. These first ten amendments became known as the Bill of Rights. Emancipation Proclamation Abraham Lincoln, 1863 As the fierce fighting of the American Civil War entered its third year, President Abraham Lincoln acted to give a new war aim to the soldiers of the Union Army. On January 1, 1863, Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, which effectively freed the slaves in the states openly rebelling against the United States. The Civil War quickly became not only a fight to preserve the Union, but also a cause for the spread of freedom to all Americans. Many of the recently freed slaves joined the Union Army or Navy 
and fought bravely for the freedom of others. The proclamation was greeted with celebration in Boston, New York, Washington, D.C., and elsewhere. In order for these words to become reality, however, much more fighting was still to come. By the end of the American Civil War in 1865, almost 200,000 African Americans had fought for the Union. In December of that year, the U.S. Constitution was amended to free all slaves living in any part of the United States. The 13th Amendment completed the work that the Emancipation Proclamation had begun, ending all slavery in the United States. Emancipation Proclamation January 1, 1863 By the President of the United States of America, a proclamation. Whereas on the 22nd day of September, in the year of our Lord 1862, a proclamation was issued by the President of the United States containing, among other things, the following, to wit, that on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state, or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then thenceforward and forever free and the executive government of the united states including the military and naval authority thereof will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons and will do no act or acts to repress such persons or any of them in any efforts they may make for their actual freedom that the executive will on the first day of january aforesaid by proclamation designate the states and parts of states if any in which the people thereof respectively shall then be in rebellion against the united states and the fact that any state or the people thereof shall on that day be in good faith represented in the congress of the united states by members chosen thereto at elections wherein a majority of the qualified voters of such state shall have participated shall in the absence of strong countervailing testimony be deemed conclusive evidence that such state and the people thereof are not then in rebellion against the united states now therefore i abraham lincoln president of the united states by virtue of the power in me vested as commander-in-chief of the army and navy of the united states in time of actual armed rebellion against the authority and government of the united states and as a fit and necessary war measure for suppressing said rebellion do on this first day of january in the year of our lord one thousand eight hundred and sixty three and in accordance with my purpose so to do publicly proclaimed for the full period of one hundred days from the day first above mentioned order and designate as the states and parts of states wherein the people thereof respectively are this day in rebellion against the united states the following to wit arkansas texas louisiana except the parishes of st bernard plaquemines jefferson st john st charles st james ascension assumption terrebonne la fourche st mary st martin and orleans including the city of new orleans mississippi alabama florida georgia south carolina north carolina and virginia except the forty-eight counties designated as west virginia and also the counties of berkeley acomac northampton elizabeth city york princess anne and norfolk including the cities of norfolk and portsmouth and which accepted parts are for the present left precisely as if this proclamation were not issued and by virtue of the power and for the purpose aforesaid i do order and declare that all persons held as slaves within said designated states and parts of states are and henceforward shall be free and that the executive government of the united states including the military and naval authorities thereof will recognize and maintain the freedom of said persons and i hereby enjoin upon the people so declared to be free to abstain from all violence unless 
in necessary self-defense, and I recommend to them that in all cases, when allowed, they labor faithfully for reasonable wages. And I further declare and make known that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed services of the United States, to garrison forts, positions, stations, and other places, and to man vessels of all sorts in said service. And upon this act, sincerely believed to be an act of justice, warranted by the Constitution, upon military necessity, I invoke the considerate judgment of mankind, and the gracious favor of Almighty God, in witness whereof I have hereunto set my hand, and caused the seal of the United States to be affixed, done at the city of Washington, this first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, and of the independence of the United States of America, the 87th. By the President, Abraham Lincoln, William H. Seward, Secretary of State. End of Section 15「The Citizens' Almanac, Section 16, Landmark Decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Datcher. The Citizens' Almanac, Fundamental Documents, Symbols, and Anthems of the United States by U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Section 16. Landmark Decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court. Since it first convened in 1790, the U.S. Supreme Court has been the central arena for debate on some of America's most important social and public policy issues, including civil rights, powers of government, and equal opportunity. As the ultimate authority on constitutional law, the Supreme Court attempts to settle disputes when it appears that federal, state, or local laws conflict with the Constitution. The Supreme Court's decisions determine how America's principles and ideals, as expressed in the Constitution, are carried out in everyday life. These decisions impact the lives of all Americans. In the following section, you'll read about several landmark decisions of the Supreme Court that are important to know and understand as a United States citizen. End of section 16. The Citizen's Almanac, Section 17, Marbury v. Madison. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Datcher. The Citizen's Almanac, Fundamental Documents, Symbols, and Anthems of the United States by U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Section 17. Marbury v. Madison, John Marshall delivering the opinion of the court, 1803. While the U.S. Supreme Court wields immense power in determining the constitutionality of federal laws, its authority was still uncertain until 1803. Although most of the framers expected the Supreme Court to perform this essential role, the court's authority was not explicitly defined in the Constitution. Chief Justice John Marshall's decision in Marbury v. Madison, speaking for a unanimous court, established the power of judicial review, making the Supreme Court an equal partner in government along with the legislative and executive branches. The Supreme Court now serves as the final authority on the Constitution. The Marbury case began in 1801 during the last few weeks of President John Adams' term as president just before Thomas Jefferson assumed the presidency. Congress had recently approved of the appointment of several new justices of the peace in and around the District of Columbia. President Adams made appointments to these positions, and the Senate confirmed each just one day before Jefferson took office. The Secretary of State was to deliver the formal appointments prior to Jefferson taking office. However, many of the commissions were not delivered on time. One of those appointed 
william marbury did not receive his commission and immediately filed suit against the new secretary of state james madison for failing to deliver it promptly marbury went directly to the supreme court seeking a writ of bandamus a legal order demanding compliance with the law to require secretary madison to deliver the commission chief justice john marshall was aware that if the court forced madison to deliver the commission jefferson and his administration would most likely ignore it and thus undermine the authority of the court marshall's decision stated that madison should have delivered the commission to marbury but the section of the judiciary act of seventeen eighty nine that gave the supreme court the power to issue writs of mandamus exceeded the authority of the court under article three of the constitution the decision upheld the law as defined in the constitution limiting the supreme court's power at the same time and establishing the fundamental principle of judicial review excerpts the question whether an act repugnant to the constitution could become the law of the land is a question deeply interesting to the united states that the people have an original right to establish for their future government such principles as in their opinion shall most conduce to their own happiness is the basis on which the whole american fabric has been erected the original and supreme will organizes the government and assigns to different departments their respective powers it may either stop here or establish certain limits not to be transcended by those departments the government of the united states is of the latter description the powers of the legislature are defined and limited that those limits may not be mistaken or forgotten the constitution is written the distinction between a government with limited and unlimited powers is abolished if those limits do not confine the persons on whom they are imposed and if acts prohibited and acts allowed are of equal obligation it is a proposition too plain to be contested that the constitution controls any legislative act repugnant to it or that the legislature may alter the constitution by an ordinary act between these alternatives there is no middle ground certainly all those who have framed written constitutions contemplate them as forming the fundamental and paramount law of the nation and consequently the theory of every such government must be that an act of the legislature repugnant to the constitution is void the theory is essentially attached to a written constitution and is consequently to be considered by this court as one of the fundamental principles of our society End of section 17